Technically, it's still afternoon. That's why you didn't respond. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's good to see you all back tonight. It was really good to see uh, a crowd of folks uh, taking off to go to the area-wide uh, youth function tonight at the Olympia Church, and very excited for them and the, and the opportunity for them to, to be together. So we are, is that me? Batteries. that sound. As my mother tells me, I probably won't be able to preach if I can't move my feet. So it'll be a short sermon or either a really long one. Pray for the short one. Glad to have everyone back tonight. It is a, um, it's a great privilege that we have. And the Lord's Day is such a special day. Uh, it provides us so many opportunities to, to spend with each other. And the, um, the response of those four this morning was, was very touching. Um, as I, I, I tell you, when you look at those four, um, there, there are not really any weak Christians in that bunch. You know, what we would consider fair weather Christians. You know, they're, they're fairly committed folks, and um, it's encouraging that, that they would see shortcomings in their life and, and want your help and your prayers and the guidance of God in order to, uh, uh, to make those things better in their life. And it, a great example for those that might be more fair weather uh, folks, I'm glad we had a big crowd here today and they got to see it as well and maybe that encouragement will uh, have a ripple effect and so it's a, it's a beautiful beautiful thing when people recognize their need for for change or for improvement in their lives tonight we're going to look at Daniel as a part of our uh, study through the books of the Bible uh, in case you didn't pick up on that hint from uh, the songs that were chosen and the scripture readings that went along with them, I'll go ahead and just, uh, I'll end the mystery for you right now. We're going to talk about Daniel tonight. Would you pray with me, please? Thank you, Father, so much for loving us and for providing all of our needs and so many of our wants in this life. You have blessed us richly and you continue to bless us abundantly and we thank you for that. And we thank you for the, the rich treasure that is your word and what it does for us, and the encouragement that we receive from it. And we pray that it would continue to be so. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for providing us your will through your word. And bless us during our time of study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as a part of our theme for the year from Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We have been surveying the books of the Bible and re-familiarizing ourselves with some that perhaps we haven't spent quite as much time in in the recent past or maybe even much at all in our lives. And also looking into some books that might be more familiar to us, but to uh, help us to understand maybe the purpose a little better or, or uh, who the receivers of the letter might have been. We're looking at the book of Daniel tonight. Daniel um, 
was written by Daniel, so it is in a sense autobiographical, and it was written during the Babylonian captivity. It appears that he was one of the early exiles as a teenager, and he spent his entire life in Babylonian and Persian exile. And he ministered to God's people and to society at large uh, around him. The purpose of this book is to call God's people to faithfulness and obedience during times of hardship. Isn't it interesting that we talk about perseverance this morning and it just so happens that Daniel is our book tonight. Uh, that was not planned on my part. It just worked out that way. Um, sometimes God's planning is a lot better than, than ours could ever be. Um, the writing style is very different in Daniel. It's what is known as apocalyptic writing. And the book of Revelation, uh, parts of Ezekiel, but Daniel in particular is what is known as apocalyptic writing. And there are unique passages that deal with future and end time occurrences. There are many signs, things that we can see and understand that are used to represent something else that is going to take place. Uh, for instance, when the dream is had by Nebuchadnezzar of the statue with the head of gold and the arms and chest of silver and the torso of bronze and the thighs of iron with the, the lower part of the leg and feet with iron and the feet mixed with toes mixed with clay. Um, everybody knows exactly what that's talking about when you look at it and you don't know anything about it at the same time. That's what apocalyptic language does and it requires some interpretation to help us to see what those things mean. Uh, the book of Revelation is highly symbolic in apocalyptic language, from chapter 4 to about the end of chapter 19 or even 20. And it's very difficult to know exactly what every sign means. The overall gist of the book of Revelation is simple to understand. We win. We win. If we're on Jesus' side, we're going to win, period. It doesn't matter what happens. But the, the intricacies of it are hard. And there's some difficult places in Daniel, even though we have seen all of these things uh, uh, come to pass. It's still hard to always get every single part of it. And I don't think God put it there for us to figure everything out. He put it there for us to see his sovereignty in the world. Daniel's perspective is very different from many of the other writers, especially in the New Testament. Because he, he doesn't deal primarily with the covenant promises to God's people in, in his subject matter. Rather, he considers the secular world outside of the covenant people of God, and he shows those empires in light of God's ultimate purposes showing how God works through even ungodly nations to bring about his purpose in the world. We're going to see that many times in the Old Testament. Uh, the Assyrians, not a nice group of people. God used them to punish the northern tribes. The Babylonians, another very not nice group of people, used to uh, punish the southern tribes. The Medo-Persians, not nearly as nasty as the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and God used them to punish the Babylonians. But they still were not nice people. And even the king of Persia saw fit to restore God's worship in Jerusalem, sending back exiles. And so as Daniel is dealing with all of these nations going through and the ultimate purposes are going to be fulfilled, Consider the statue once again. The head, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head. That's the Babylonian Empire. But after you comes one, not quite as, as powerful as yours, not quite as rich as yours, just like gold and silver differ. Well, the, the empire that followed were the Medo-Persians, and the bronze empire that followed and displaced the Medo-Persians would have been the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered the world and he left a language behind, a language that was so specific and so universal that God chose to not only translate the Old Testament into it and it would have been the, the scriptures of Jesus and the apostles 
the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, but the New Testament writers wrote in the very same language. And we still have the, those very words today, not the original copies, obviously, but the very words, and we still today know exactly what those words mean and can translate those things. God brought, if for no other reason, and we know there are many purposes for what God does, but he brought in a universal language and he set it in place so that it would be available to use to spread his word. The legs of iron and then the, the lower legs and feet that are mixed with iron and clay, well, that's the Roman Empire, the, for the following empire. That empire created a road system that was second to none throughout the history of the world. And we had a universal language and we had a road system that was phenomenal. And you had the Pax Romana. It was peace. And the gospel was able to spread throughout the known world in, in less than two generations. It was incredible. And God worked through those, what we would understand as ungodly nations to bring about a godly purpose. And so that's how Daniel is, is dealing with, he's not dealing with the, the promises made to Abraham or the promises made to, uh, to whomever. He is dealing with uh, a much broader vision that God has for the world. Uh, as our previous couple of books have done, Daniel breaks into two uh, very natural sections. The first six chapters are the events related to Daniel's ministry in Babylon and in Persia. And the second part of that, chapters 7 through 12, basically deal with the visions that he has and attempting to help uh, the readers to understand, uh, in a sense, what is taking place there. As we outline this book, we're going to see uh, the first chapter deals with Daniel and his friends and the preparation that they were uh, giving. Um, you know, it's God, God has a sense of humor. You, you can give these guys over here the absolute best food and, and the best of everything. We just want the vegetables. Just, just let, you know, we'll, just, we'll just eat the vegetables. We'll be all right. And water. No, really, you've got to eat more than that. No, no, we'll do that. And at the end of the period, which ones were better off? The ones that were not eating the, the best food available, but the ones that God uh, loved and, and acknowledged for their obedience to him. Uh, we see Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue there in chapter 2 and chapter 3. We see the fiery furnace. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream in chapter 4. We see the handwriting on the wall. Now, uh, our sweet sister Jenny sent me a message this afternoon and asked if I was going to write on the wall instead of using slides to talk about Daniel. And I don't know where she would get the idea that I would understand something like that because I, I don't tell any kind of jokes like that at all. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the best amen that I'll probably get tonight right there. Um, but the, the writing on the wall is... Um, it's party time in Babylon. And we're, gonna ha we're not only going to have a party, but go fetch the instruments of worship from the temple in Jerusalem. And that night, a hand writes on the wall, and that was the end of the Babylonian Empire. And the Medo-Persians came in and cleaned them out. We have the lion's den narrative there in uh, chapter 6. Chapter 7, the vision of the four beasts. Chapter 8, the vision of the kingdoms. Chapter 9, Daniel's prayer and the 70 weeks vision. There's a message of encouragement in chapter 10 and chapter 11 and chapter 12 would in, uh, be kind of a concluding chapter discussing troubles and victory. Troubles and victory. And so that's our basic uh, understanding of the book of Daniel. It is uh, a fairly easy read. You can sit down and read it in a very short period of time, but to study it would take years and years and years, and you would probably never reach the bottom of all the things that you could come up with reading there. Uh, once again, proving itself to be the word of God because a man couldn't write something like that. It just can't happen. Well, tonight I want to talk about our, uh, our Christian citizenship. Our Christian citizenship. 
And I invite you to uh, join me in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. There's some things that I want to point out to us today that are um, great examples from here that apply very uniquely to our day and time. We'll read verses 8 through 30. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up. Now, if you are ready at this time, you, excuse me, now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor we worship the gold image which you have set up. I'm going to stop right there, and I, I want to bring you to a, an understanding of something you may be aware of during World War II. There was a British unit um, that was trapped by the Nazis during World War II, and they were in radio communication with uh, their headquarters and they were told that they they needed to to hold on and that the British would try to rescue them but they couldn't guarantee that they would be rescued and they sent a three word response but if not. And only the biblically literate would understand what they were saying. We, we will be true. We will hold our place. And we will wait for you. But if you don't come, we're still not going to give up. But if not. A three-word response. That's powerful. That's really powerful. And how how the Western world has fallen from that knowledge and understanding of God's word. Continuing, verse 19. The Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the, command, the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men 
bound into the midst of the fire. They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected. And the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. May God bless the reading of his word. There's so much we can talk about from this section of scripture, but I want to talk about our citizens, our citizenry as Christians. Christians that live in today's world have both a responsibility to be faithful to God and a responsibility to be productive in society. We, we have a responsibility. We are not called to be a commune and withdraw and separate ourselves and build high walls. That is, that is not what we are called to do. And just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego rose to very high places within the government, we should strive to do our very best at whatever our vocation is in the earth. They loved God, but they also did an outstanding job at whatever it was that they did. They understood their responsibility. And likewise, we should as well. Our first priority as Christians is to live within the will of God. I, th I think we do that very well. I think we understand that we must obey God rather than men. But we also as Christians should be committed to upholding and obeying the moral consensus of our society in as far as it does not conflict with the will of God. There is an unfortunate mindset that came out about 20 or 25 years ago. You can't legislate morality. Every law is legislated morality. Every law in the books is legislated morality. It's some, it might not be God's morality, but it is morality. It is what, uh, what we see as right and wrong, or else there would be no need for a law. Stopping at a red light and going at a green light is legislated morality. It's for the safety of society. It's for an orderly uh, way to move about and transport ourselves. But it is a moral judgment that we need this traffic signal to control this. And so we have a moral obligation to uphold the law. We, as, we can't say, well, I, I abide under the will of God so I can run this red light. You know. Or I can do whatever it is that I can park wherever I want. I can park in front of a fire hydrant. I can do whatever I, I choose to do because I, I'm under the will of God. No. We have dual citizenship. Dual citizenship. And a lot of our future citizenship in heaven is going to be determined by how we use our citizenship on earth. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were law-abiding to the letter of the law until 
it conflicted with God's will. And that's where they drew the line. But other than that, you know, I, I can remember when seatbelt laws became the vogue. And people, I don't, I'm not going to wear a seatbelt. I don't like to wear a seatbelt. Well, I realize there are some situations where seatbelts do more harm than good, but overwhelmingly seatbelts save more lives than they cost lives. And it's for the benefit of everybody. You know, if you're just driving down the road minding your own business and somebody runs into your vehicle and knocks you out of your seat and you lose control of your vehicle, well, your vehicle can go places and cause harm to somebody else too. So it's not just about you. Um, and so it does no harm to the will of God to obey the law and click your seatbelt. And there are many other laws we could look into that people have difficulty with. You know, um, we, we, we need to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we need to be committed. You know, if the, you know who the most moral abi uh, people are that, that I see in the United States of America? Our Mormon neighbors. They're some of the most moral people I've ever known. They, they, they obey the laws. They do all these things. They're very good. I mean, they do all kinds of things, even though we would have some major disagreements with them, spiritually speaking. And everybody else recognizes that, too. It doesn't mean they want to answer the door when they come knock on the door. But they recognize them as good citizens. We need to be known for that as well. We need to be known as, as good citizens, law-abiding citizens. And insofar as we are able to uphold the law of the land. Christians also uh, can and they should contribute to society. A good friend of mine who preaches, and uh, he teaches at Freed Hardeman University, his father is an elder in the church in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. And he was just uh, offered a cabinet position with the governor of Kentucky last week. Do we need Christians in government? Boy, do we. And I'm not talking about the people who are Christians when they're running for re-election. Right? I'm talking about people who've been living it and who continue to live it. We need that influence in government. And if it's just one person, if it's one Daniel, that's, we're better off. We are better off. And I know many others. Um, a, a very dear friend of mine who, um, I lived in her basement for almost two months uh, when we moved to Tennessee when I was preaching there until we could find a place to live. Her name is Sheila Butt, and she is a state representative in the state of Tennessee. And she is very vocal against any laws that, that come across for consideration that don't agree with God's law. And she's paid the price for it, and she has stood firm. But she is also a very good citizen, and she understands her responsibility. There are many, many others we could talk about uh, most of whom most we probably don't even know, who have been mayors, who have been school principals, who have been school teachers, who have been in positions to impact society for the better. And we're better off because of them. At the same time, we can and should uh, contribute to society we must listen to and obey the higher orders of God, just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. You know, many of the laws were neither moral or unmoral as far as God's law was concerned, and they, they served Nebuchadnezzar faithfully. But when the laws conflicted with the higher orders that we all have, they chose to follow the higher orders of God. And what a great example. You know, we... <clears throat> We have relegated so many of our Old Testament stories to children's stories. You ever notice that? 
the, you know, the ark or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel and the lion's den. You know, we've turned those into children's stories. Those are not ch those are adult stories. When you read the details of those stories, those are adult stories. The fire was so hot that the men who threw them into the fire were killed on the spot. You know, that's not Saturday morning cartoons. And if it was heat that killed them instantly, it was probably a very gory and horrific death. And there's still so much we can learn. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and to be trampled underfoot by men. Who is Jesus saying was the salt of the earth? His followers. That's us. There is a, a savoriness. There's a, there's a quality to Christians that changes the society in which they live. Even when people don't like us for doing what's right, we still, when we do it the way God asked us to, we make a proper statement in society. And salt not only adds to the savoriness of food, but it also is a preservative. And we have the opportunity to preserve our society by impacting it in a positive manner for God. We have many of those opportunities. And, you know, I don't know that our nation is so far gone that it can't come back. It very well may be. But, you know, that's God's call ultimately. But can we be good citizens and follow God's law? We can. And so we are the salt of the earth. Jesus also says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. In other words, you can't hide your Christianity and claim you're a Christian. You can't claim to follow God behind closed doors in these four walls and then go out and act like there's nothing different in your life. You have a responsibility to be that reflective light in the world. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Even, even some who do not agree with you will see your good works and in an indirect or direct way give glory to God. And we may never know who those people are. I'm going to embarrass Gene real quick. because he, he, He'll turn redder than anybody else if I embarrass him. Uh, most of you are aware that uh, Jean uh, began teaching at Green River last year. And uh, he apparently did such a capable job that they gave him a full-time job over there. And there was a young man who was having some, some personal difficulties that he had in one of his classes. And he started asking Jean about Christianity. Now, how would he know to ask Gene about Christianity when Gene's talking about trees? The question kind of answers itself, doesn't it? And he would not have known to ask Gene if Gene was not being the salt and the light that he's been called to be. In a little bitty school, in a little bitty place, in a little bitty department within the school, and there he is having an opportunity to have an impact on somebody's life. And we never know. He may never live to see the outcome of his influence there. But I, I pray to God that, that he does. The young man Corbin has visited with us on a number of occasions. 
he has come to the Tuesday night Bible study. And we just don't know. We don't know what impact all of us will have in this young man's life because Gene decided to just be a Christian, to do what he does. And in those small ways, we can change the world. We can change the world. Millions and millions of people within an hour's drive of us. And we have an opportunity to change the world by being a Shadrach, a Meshach, or a Abednego. Or if you prefer, a Daniel. We're so blessed to have the opportunity to have God's word, to have these incredible accounts of what people of old did in trying circumstances and how they stood firm for God despite um, being on the unpopular side of things. Christians are not the most popular people in America today. Guess what? That's okay. Because our citizenship is in heaven. I carry a U.S. passport, but th this, is, this is my eternal passport. This one trumps the other one because this one doesn't expire in 2018 like mine does here and have to get it renewed. This never expires. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God endures forever. We just need to stick to God's word. We're blessed to have this opportunity. And in our small way, in our small corner of the world, let us be the salt, let us be the light, let us follow the example of Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And let's make a difference. Let's make a difference. If you're here tonight, and uh, as our brothers and sisters came forward this morning, and there are circumstances for which you'd like for us to pray, we would love to do that for you tonight. Or if you happen to be here tonight, and you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus, never put on Jesus in baptism, we would love to talk with you about that tonight as well. If you have a need, whatever it may be, won't you come as together we stand and sing.